Hey everyone, this is Nick from the Botch Pit, and today we're going to be talking about a game called Hunter the Vigil. Now, what is a hunter? Well, in the game Hunter the Vigil, these hunters are a little different than the ones that you may have had some experience with in the old World of Darkness line, Hunter the Reckoning. In Hunter the Vigil, a hunter is no more than a normal human. Now, what makes Hunter the Vigil such an interesting game is because you are a normal human going up against supernatural elements. Those elements can range from ghosts, werewolves, vampires, you name it. What a hunter is, is someone who knows of the existence of these creatures. And that is what makes them different than just the everyday mortal and their fight or drive against them. So a question that is often asked is, because a hunter is just a normal human, they're mortal, how does a human become a hunter? So the very core concept of Hunter the Vigil is there exists two entities, the shadow and the light. So what the shadow is, is the world that currently exists engulfed in all these supernatural manifestations, all this evil that exists in this world and the idea that people are being pulled into this, innocent lives are being lost due to this darkness. And what the hunter is, is the hunter is the light. It is a soul light. They are one person that exists in this world of darkness that try to light the way. That is what they call the vigil. That's what this whole book is about. When a human witnesses this shadow that exists and they do something about it, that is the key turning point of when a mortal becomes a hunter. And hunters fight against this darkness by, you know, exposure, tape recordings, audio logs, or someone who is going to fight against this darkness through, say, like, physical means. As it can be seen, it really comes down to the proper creation of a vanilla Chronicles of Darkness character that needs to come first before the hunter template can be applied to it. And that's really the methodology that should be gone about before even picking up the hunter book make sure you have a human character that you know you not only relate to but someone that has witnessed this darkness and who is obliged now to fight back against it another sort of shining moment about hunter is the sheer emphasis of teamwork or the building of relationships and contacts that need to be done in order to say even take down a supernatural creature such as a werewolf. We're not even going to talk about like geist, very high level creatures because that's really, really tough for a hunter to take down because they're just a lone human. However, a whole group of humans taking on one werewolf will definitely increase those odds. And that also kind of coincides with the whole thought about the hunter as a visual as a lone light to light the darkness. When you have one flashlight lighting up the darkness only so much gets seen however if you have a whole group of people all shining flashlights against it stuff becomes a little bit more illuminated and it's just a very good representation about how building these connections can increase the potential power to fight back before going any further into the core mechanics or a little bit more in depth about hunter something else i'd like to really drive home as a big overview is that Hunter the Vigil is not a happy game. Now, in all of Chronicles of Darkness, it could be stated that, you know, in the end, does anyone really ever get out of the predicaments they're in? Um, it's very difficult. It's very tough. However, with Hunter specifically, there's not really a happy end to Hunter. Hunters don't ever have good endings. And I know that's really really sad for me to say as we just begin this but it's just something to really you know kind of drive down deep and hardcore with you know not only yourself but your players that you know a hunter shouldn't be happy and i know that really sucks to hear but like for example as time progresses with hunters you know the zeal this closure against the world you know kind of fighting back against all these supernatural elements that exist you know you, you, you sound almost crazy you sound like you know but by the end of it w w what is left you know we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail later however it's something to really consider when playing hunter characters that they have many flaws they have many tilts over time these people don't really end up 
in a good position, you know, the longer they keep up the vigil. However, as long as they know that this vigil is driving them and that they're able to, in their mind, think that they're doing some good for the world, that's what really pushes them. But realistically, it's not a happy end. So what could potentially be some, you know, resources to kind of think of when you're building a hunter character? And what I would like to offer is a few pop culture icons that many people would know that could be kind of construed as hunter characters, which would be kind of cool to think about. One of the first ones that kind of sticks in my mind whenever I think of Hunter uh, specifically is actually Dib Membrane from Invader Zim, who anyone who has watched that show would clearly see the patterns between, you know, exposing this alien creature to the world in some way, shape, or form. Another set of characters that could be seen as Hunter characters could be Fox Mulder and Dana Scully from the X-Files. Clear inspiration for Hunter characters that I had in the past fall underneath these two, both trying to find the truth as well as how you know, the organization that they work under falls within the Hunter realm, which we'll talk about again a little later in this recording. Other characters that you could see, and I'm just going to give two more as examples. You know, depending on the, the chronicle and what you're going with, say you were fighting against the God Machine, you could definitely use Sarah Connor. Clear Hunter, clear devotion against getting rid of this one type of character, in this case, the Terminator, you know, that exists. And I have had a character in the past, which I'll use as a, to illustrate a lot of these examples. Um, for that actually fell within this dimension. Finally, we need to talk about, you know, the king himself, but when we talk about, you know, Hunter, a really good inspiration for Hunter is also Ash Williams from Evil Dead. The one specifically I'm thinking about is from uh, Ash vs. Evil Dead, where he, you know, returned back to the main world and was just living his normal life, and then he retook the mantle up against the Deadites. Again, all pop culture icons, all from a broad range of different mediums, but all could be kind of construed and seen as hunter characters. And all these examples really illustrate the whole taking up a mantle against the supernatural in one way, shape, or form. Also, if you really look at these examples, they rely on others in order to get their goals somewhat achieved. So going forward, I'm going to assume that you already have a vanilla Chronicles of Darkness character already created. And what we're going to do is talk about some of the hunter adjustments that need to be made to this core character. As mentioned before, hunters operate in groups. And these groups are what are called cells. And they comprise of, you know, depending on how many players you have in a game, let's just say three to four. And they all use specialized tactics that they learn together in order to bring down monsters. Uh, and there are also some cases where monsters can join cells as well, but we'll save that for a later time. But it's important to know that what this is called in terms of you know, the level of organizations in Hunter, is this is called a first tier, with the second tier being compacts and the third tier being conspiracies, which are greater and greater organizations which Hunters could potentially join. Let's say for the sake of the storyteller that a cell isn't an option, first tier is not an option, and we can only choose from second or third tier options. So we have to go with one of the pre-assigned compacts or conspiracies. Now, I'm first going to give a little bit of my thoughts on this process in regards to whether they should be assigned to either one or the other. First thing I want to kind of acknowledge is that you have very limited choices. And at this point in time, this broadcast is being done on the Hunter of the Vigil first edition. And a second edition was just recently announced, which I'm kind of really excited about because it actually kind of coincides with the way that I like to play Hunter a lot more. But when really picking your choices, you're very limited to a few of each. So that kind of is a little bit of a downer that you have to fit within one of these compacts or conspiracies. But hopefully we'll see in the newer book, there's a little bit more leniency into what you can actually do. So a compact is also known as the second tier. And compacts can be everything from a regional organization of hunters to a worldwide group with strict rules limiting its numbers. So compacts are easy to find and join. They offer a great deal of practical experience, as well as a few resources that hunters might need that they've not had before. They're also fairly easy to switch between as most compacts do not have the energy of manpower to hunt down a rogue member. Now, however, compacts also have a number of weaknesses 
over more established conspiracies, which we'll talk about in a second. But most compacts are relatively new. As a result, some compacts actually lack a true focus and can fall prey to infighting between members. New compacts also have to rely more on rumor of information and not having centralized resources to gather data from. And also something to consider is that due to the small size of the compact, members might be actually harder to find in order to take down groups of supernatural enemies. So some examples of compacts would be like Ashwood Abbey, the Barrett Commission, Division 6, the Hunt Club, the Illuminated Brotherhood, the Long Knight, Loyalists of Thull, Network Zero, and the Union. So akin to compacts is this conspiracies, also called the third tier as mentioned before, which are vast organizations of great power and influence, be it through you know either government support, religious decree, or simply surviving for thousands of years, whereas compacts have existed for, say, hundreds of years. Many conspiracies work in secret, away from the public's eye, and quite a few are dedicated to keeping the supernatural forces hidden from average people. They also tend to have more far-reaching networks, reliable resources, and superior knowledge than compacts as well. Now, in addition to all the benefits we stated that conspiracies have compared to compacts before, I really want to touch upon endowments, which are powers developed specifically by a conspiracy that allow to do things a normal mortal would not be able to. Now, these include specific weapons, they include, you know, the use of talismans, so on and so forth. However, although they sound appealing, many endowments come with a steep cost to use. So some gradually even corrodes, like say someone's soul, some literally poison the person drawing upon it, and most uh, even keep their user from ever having a chance at leaving the conspiracy if the stakes become too high as well. There are a lot of drawbacks with endowments. However, only really conspiracy members can use them, which is something when I began, you know, playing Hunter, I didn't really understand. Now something also to keep in mind is that endowments are different than say like merits. Basically, when you join a conspiracy, you're allowed to get access, you know, depending on your status within that conspiracy itself. There are plenty of conspiracies out there as well. Uh, some of the ones that I like to mention are, you know, the Ascending Ones, the Lucifuge, and uh, my absolute favorite, Task Force Valkyrie. Those who are familiar with the original World of Darkness book, Hunter the Reckoning, will actually see some overlap between the books that are in that line and the names of these combats and conspiracies. As a fun fact, that's where a lot of these actually come from. I would like to also mention that the equipment that hunters use can be very creative in the way that you employ mundane objects in order to accomplish certain goals. For example, having lighters is always a good idea. Having waterproof matches, always a good idea bringing tape with you, duct tape specifically, always a good idea. Or an aerosol can, for example, to kind of combine all this into one to make a blowtorch. And also to remember that these objects individually won't cause nearly the suspicion that a blowtorch would. Remember to be somewhat realistic with your item sheet that a normal human could potentially carry. And it's always a good idea to run this list by your storyteller before even beginning to implement them in the game. So now that we know a little bit more about how a hunter character is created, we probably can get the picture that Hunter is a very mysterious game. It is about wanting knowledge, about searching for knowledge, it's about sharing the knowledge you know with other players, um, and also keeping that knowledge to yourself or potentially exposing it. It is a very down-to-earth game, and that's what I really enjoy about it. Now that we've discussed the setting, the atmosphere, some of the core elements of Hunter, what I wanted to do to kind of wrap this up was give an example of a Hunter character that I've been playing over the past few months and, you know, the state of just what a game can potentially do to a character. So, one of the Hunter characters that has frequently appeared in the Botchbit Chronicle of Darkness game that we've been playing is named Valerie Fox. Uh, and she's a member of Task Force Valkyrie, who is one of those conspiracies that we talked about earlier in this broadcast. And what she's been exposed to as a normal human, in terms of what the Chronicle has actually gone through, is staggering. For example, she's currently paired with a Geist, actually two Geists, a werewolf, has fought vampires, interacted with werewolves, has gone up against god machine characters, you know, is chilling with mages, has been 
fighting against this like god tier mage and you know a billion things under the sun that no human could potentially kind of go through and kind of be okay afterwards so during the course of this campaign i think she's been in about 10 sessions now if i remember correctly but you know in addition to interacting with other hunters she has to interact with this stuff on the daily basis and what has kind of happened to this character over this given time is that you wouldn't really retain as much sanity as you think you would in these types of situations you wouldn't necessarily be the same person that you were at the beginning of this that you would be at this point in time in the campaign if that were to make sense as in you've seen so many of your you know squad die basically by your own hands by accident you've seen people you try to save die uh for none of your own actions you've had to be saved in situations where you couldn't do anything about it you had to fight ghosts imagine fighting ghosts as a normal person this is not things that a normal person would deal with and so what we've had to do over the course of the campaign and what i've started to implement is a lack of sanity and we've discussed that hunter isn't necessarily a game where anything ever resolves for these people and that's something that is it's hard to deal with not just as you know the storyteller and, and the player but you know that you know anytime you pick up this character they could just die where other people would take the hit and just be okay in our campaign uh she was actually killed and i was somewhat upset about it uh because it was in a situation where you couldn't really do anything about it and we brought her back but still it was one of those wake-up calls where even though like your squad mate who's a werewolf can get you know smacked six ways to sunday and you take a flick from that you're dead and that's that's a really tough thing to deal with as a hunter especially when you play with other characters that can soak the damage that you can't even come near however what is really cool about Hunters, and something to look forward to in the second edition book, is we've toyed with this idea with our campaign, but we never really implemented it, but what happens to someone who is fanatical um, about a certain you know, group or faction in Chronicles of Darkness? So they're fanatical about some sort of werewolf or something. What could be drawn upon this is that hunters can technically be turned into what are called slashers, which is a whole section I'll keep to another uh, broadcast. But basically, what a slasher is in Chronicles of Darkness and World of Darkness is like kind of taking a human and then turning them into this raging killing machine. But that's not something you would want to do with every hunter, but it's something that hunters could realistically be turned into based upon what they've seen it's just a cool concept but something to consider but at the end of the day what you really need to do as a hunter character is you know just consult with your storyteller talk about certain things and make sure that you know you do your best because at the end of the day with hunter that's all you can really ask for is just your best this has been nick from the botch pit thank you, thank you.